Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Today is the third week of Advent already. Today we will be centering ourselves in anticipation of the light that still comes, rooting ourselves in the invitation to light the candle of love. As we join together in worship this morning, let us look for the Spirit and open ourselves to our work in our midst as we pray together. God of all grace, pour forth your Holy Spirit in this, our time of worship, and also in our daily lives, that we may have the strength of which the world knows not, that we may be led into all truth, and that in the midst of our earthly trials and uncertainties, we may have the peace that passes understanding through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Welcome to worship. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. With the coming of this light, there is love. Such great love helps us to love God and one another. can do that can't be done There's nothing you can sing that can't be sung Nothing you can say but you can learn how to play the game It's easy There's nothing you can make that can't be made no one you can save that can't be saved There's nothing you can do But you can learn how to be you in time It's easy All you need is love All you need is love All you need is love 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 is all you need. All you need is love. Is all you need. There's nothing you can know that isn't known. Nothing you can see that isn't shown. Nowhere you can be that isn't where you're meant to be. Need. 
Well, I want to add my welcome to church this morning. My name is Jeff Lindsay, senior pastor. How's it going? How's your past week been? Have you been overwhelmed? Have the details been crazy? Have you been checking through your list? Know that God has been with you. And we come back each week to remind ourselves of that, to remind each other of that, and to open up God's word, to sing God's hymns, and to hear a good word placed on the preacher's hearts that will keep us connected, keep us understanding what's happening in our life and who's invested in our life and to remember how much God loves us. This season of Advent is a great reminder of God's love for us. This, this time of waiting and anticipation and preparation for this great news that God has worked in God's creation, sending Jesus to come as as a baby to live his life, to show us the way, to go to the cross, to make our life count well into eternity. So we come together as the people of God in God's house to remember these good things, to celebrate Advent in all of its glory, to look forward to Christmas and this great gift of Jesus. So my friends, welcome to church today. You know, as we continue through the Advent journey, as we head towards Christmas, the, the church is really <laughs> hard at work trying to create places where you can focus on the wonderful scriptures of this Advent season, to think about Jesus in new and profound ways, and to think about the ways that we can connect to our faith. So we have extra services and extra experiences, and we hope that you are paying attention. I hope you get that Wednesday e-news and you go through it with your calendar and make sure that you are connected to all the events. And then when you're not quite sure or want more, you go to our website. And at our website, <laughs> you find uh, even more things that you can connect with, be a part of, connect with, that will help you and encourage you on your faith journey. One of the great traditions in the life of this church is a service called Lessons and Carols. It's because we have such wonderful talent, wonderful musicians, and have had for forever in the life of this church. God continues to bless us. And so the great passages of scripture, the great hymns and solos of the church and the season come together in a service of Lessons and Carols. It's next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Why am I telling you that? because it's gonna be our first live stream service. We're gonna be doing live streaming starting in January. Again, we won't be here, but we'll be doing the service live that you'll be able to partake of. It will be recorded, so you'll be able to connect it throughout the day and even into the week. But if you want the experience, you want the feeling of getting up on a Sunday morning and being a part of worship, we're creating that for you. Starting with the service on the 20th, the service of lessons and carols. We also are going to do something really fun. It's called the Bring the Light Drive Up event. It's kind of an all staff, all play. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to transform this campus even more than it already has been. If you've come to the campus, you know the meeting house is in full dress, the, the North Common, the parking lot with its lights. We've got candy canes and lights that are covering. The berm in the North Common, uh, the North parking lot. But we're going to do even more. We're going to invite you to come the evening of the Lessons and Carols. So it'll be from 5 to 5.30. Maybe you decorate your car. Get some battery-operated lights and maybe get some crepe paper and some signs and decorate your car kind of like a float. And then drive it past the church, coming through all of its lights and all the things we've got for you to be surprised about. Santa Claus is going to be here. There's going to be a little bag of treats. We're going to even give you a family size container of chili because that's what you do in Advent. And then we're going to invite you to experience our campus and then to drive by our neighbors right next door at the waters. We've told them to be watching out their windows. You can stop by, deliver a card of greeting to them and just drive by and Bring some cheer to our neighbors who really need it. Some of you who have been around this church know over the last year we have been thinking about what we call the Blessing Initiative. This church decided to set aside a million dollars to do good in and through the community of faith here. 
at the church. We already gave 200,000 of that money away during the craziness that was happening in the Twin Cities where there was a need for all kinds of things. And so we blessed some of our ministry partners with a couple hundred thousand dollars to help some of our neighbors get through a hard times. The rest of that $800,000 is now going to be focused on 30 applicants that have offered some ideas of how we can mobilize this church to do good for Christ's sake. And so we're on to the next stage. We've got the applications. The screeners are going through it. We're trying to decide who some of the recipients will be of some of the money. And then you'll be involved helping to vote about where that money will go. Very exciting time. And I hope that you are praying for all that are involved, all involved with the Blessing Initiative. And lastly, I just want to remind you that Christmas is coming, which means the long-standing tradition of this church of doing Christmas Eve services will not be missed. We want you to know that uh, we will be offering a Christmas Eve service that will be reminiscent of uh, your experience if you were to show up here. It won't be exact, but a lot of the same things will be involved, and I think there'll be some surprises that will bless you as we get through this season and look into our future. So December 24th at 7 o'clock on YouTube and Facebook will be a wonderful service. As the Advent wreath comes to full glory, as we think about the light that Christ has brought into the world and the opportunity that we have to take it to the world on behalf of our Savior Jesus. So come, be a part of that. Blessings for you in all of what you do in this Advent season. And lastly, I just want to tell you that even though we're not gathering for worship, the church is open for small groups of people to come through. We have this wonderful thing called the Stations of the Wreath. We have stations set up through the North Common and all the way through our meeting house where you can stop and think about all of the different items that are remembered in the Advent wreath. There'll be a station about peace and about hope and about joy and about love. A chance for you to see the church, to be present in your place of worship, to think about what Christ is bringing into the world on our behalf and to ponder that for yourself. So, be involved, be connected, celebrate this Advent season, and rejoice because of God's faithfulness in Jesus this Christmas and, of course, every Christmas. Welcome to worship. This is one of my favorite times of the service is when we pause as the body of Christ and we pray. My friends, what has your prayer life been like these last months in this pandemic season? Have you found yourself praying more for the needs of your friends and family? Have you been praying about the issues and concerns of the world? Have you been praying that you would be open to God's speaking to you and God ministering to you and encouraging you? Has this season kind of worked on your prayer life? My encouragement to you is try to pay attention to that. Maybe capitalize on that as you go forward, that maybe your prayer life has expanded in a way that you hadn't noticed before. Because God invites us to pray. God invites us into community with God to hear our concerns, to hear our praises, to hear our thoughts, our needs, our hopes, our dreams. We are connecting to a living God when we pray. Let's remember that as we pause and pray today. God, we are halfway through Advent. The Advent wreath is coming to glow with all of those wonderful understandings of your love that you call us to as well. To be people of peace and hope and love and joy. To be Jesus people. To be not only followers of Jesus, but to be people that live out the mandates, the encouragements, the expressions the example of Jesus. It's Advent, which means it's the beginning of the story revealed in this world. It's God being faithful to the promises that he had made for hundreds of years and revealed in Jesus. And Jesus, we praise you and thank you for your faithfulness to come to this world as baby, to live 
throughout your life, showing us what it means to live the life of faith, faithful to God, faithful to God's commandments, faithful to God's people. And then showing us what it means to humble yourself, calling us to a new level of humility and all that that might mean as we relate to you, as we relate to each other, as we relate to the world and the great needs of the world. So we're grateful for the church year, the calendar that brings us back to this season again. And so God, we pray that the light of your wreath, the light that keeps coming because of the power of your spirit and because of your profound love for us, God, help us to truly be people of hope, to truly offer peace, to experience a sense of joy and gladness like we've never experienced before. All centered in your love. All centered in you, Jesus. So help us to open our hearts and open our minds in ways that you can minister to us, encourage us, direct us, lead us. Both as individuals, as the church, as this church, as your people in this world. Trying to do good for your for your sake, Jesus. So thank you for meeting us in this hour. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for reminding us through your scriptures and the, the sung word and the preached word that you are with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are for us, that you are transforming us, that you are blessing us every day. So you've carried us on to completion and we reside with you one day in glory. We offer you these prayers these days as we pause and let our brothers and sisters listening to the service today offer their concerns in this hour. And now, adding to the prayers of concern with those being prayed, we offer the prayers for this community that need your encouragement, that need your hand of healing, that need your presence to give them the hope that they need. As they face the challenges of their health and as they look forward to the ways that they'll be restored and renewed. Lord, we continue to pray for Polly Patrick and Ali Zomer. We ask that you continue to be with Harlan Erickson and Steve Colby. Continue to bless Bob Gubrud and Christine Larson with your presence. Finish your good work in Dick Kulioth and Richard Bucklin and John Wiggins. Bless Dan Bryant and Maureen Zhao with their immediate need. And Lord, we pray for comfort for the family of Donald Larson, upon whose family we were some of the very beginnings of this church. As we entrust Don now into your care, we ask that you would bless his family with memory after memory that will sustain them in the days to come. Continue to be with Joyce Lovestrand in the sudden death of her son, Paul. May she find comfort in her profound faith and trust in you. And God, we continue to lift up the wonderful work of young life around the world, but especially our mission of the month. Be with Minneapolis Urban Young Life and all who serve the students of the North Side. May they experience you in profound ways because of the examples and the experiences of love that they experienced in Young Life. And bless all of our missionaries and bless us on the mission here and around the world as you continue to call us individually and as the church. Now hear us as we Pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
It's good to pray together. It's good that we can trust that God hears our prayers. Part of my prayer each day is that God would continue to offer me the grace and mercy that I need. That I can step out knowing that I have been forgiven. That I can have the peace of that grace that allows me to offer love to my neighbors. And so my friends, you too have that peace if you've received it. Now, pass that peace to those that are with you in person or those that you might want to offer that to through a text or for an email or a phone call. Pass the peace as I offer you the peace of Christ. Hey kids, it's Pastor Sarah and it's our time in the service. So come on and sit close. Okay, are you ready? So I was wondering how many of you have been following along with the Advent calendar? I have. It's been so much fun, right? We get to hear stories and we've been singing some songs and Georgie talked to us. Georgie and I both got new hairdos. What do you think, huh? Pretty cool. Well, today we are talking about how God is love. And in the midst of Christmas, I thought maybe I could ask you a question just like do you ask George a question last week. My question is, what is your favorite Christmas song? Which one? Um, is it Joy to the World? How about that one? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Is that your favorite? Oh, not that one? Huh. Oh, God rest ye merry gentle people, let nothing you dismay. You don't like that one? Oh. Oh, hark the herald angels sing. Do you like that one? Well, let me tell you my favorite. My favorite Christmas carol is a song called O Holy Night. Do you know that song? We sing it basically every year at Christmas Eve. And it's one of my favorites. And the reason for that is because it reminds us that when Jesus comes into the world, bringing with us love for everyone, that it's also a love that makes the world right for everyone. There's a so part of the song where it says, God's law is love and his gospel is peace. You know, like peace. Peace inside and peace in between everyone. Peace between siblings and peace between grown-ups who have a hard time liking each other. Because that's what love does, is God's love, when it comes in Jesus, opens us to remember that love is something for us. It's something we share with one another. And that's the light of Jesus that comes into our world to remind us that love is something that God has meant for all of us to be able to share with one another. So whatever your favorite Christmas carol, whether you don't like mine even, we all get to sing songs as loud as you want to sing them. And remember that on this one holy night, love came into our world and it's a love that's for all of us. Merry Christmas. May God's love hold you fast. We'll see you later. The scripture reading for today is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 28. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Here ends the scripture reading for today. As we continue in worship, will you pray with me? God of all love, on this morning or whenever we're watching, we come as a people looking for the light, in need of the light that it would still come. And so
So come, O oh come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, for we are all a people in need of your love. Be with us, O oh Christ. Amen. Having grown up in the western metro of the Twin Cities, I heard about this church when I was a kid. And one of the things that I knew about all of you, now me too, <laughs> is that you were a people who wrestled. A people who brought your hearts and minds and whole lives to the living and embodiment of faith. Not a people who were all of one thought, <laughs> Not a people who agreed about everything, but a people who gathered not because of creed, but because of a belief in the transformative power of Jesus Christ. And you sought to be a people who lived that law of love in your personal lives, in Edina, in the Twin Cities, and in the world. Now, much of that I respected. Some of it made me a little nervous. You see, I grew up in a tradition inside of Christianity that taught me that there was one way to understand all things. And to think that you could have a bunch of people who came together to worship Jesus and they might think different things. I mean, goodness sakes. <laughs> I sound like I'm like my grandma or something. But this sense of that this has always been a community we're wrestling together and gathering. We bring our whole lives, our hearts, our minds, and ourselves to together discern the ways that God's law of love invites us. That's been a marker of this community. And it's why, as I come to this sermon today, to talk about the third candle that we light during Advent, which is love, that I want to invite us to reconsider love's invitation not as a binary, but as a holistic call to live the way of love and the gospel of peace, of shalom. A shalom which is meant for our inner well-beings, for our personal relationships, but a shalom that is, seeks to order and reorder the entirety of all human civilization. And that is where we gather this time during Advent, looking for and awaiting the advent, the coming of Emmanuel God with us, who brings in his coming a kingdom not of this world, but one that is rooted in the God of all love and all life. So let's look for the light together. One of the aspects of the tradition inside of Christianity that I think this community has embodied is that sense of holding together tensions. We say that it's one of our core values, right? Wrestle with the tensions. Now I need, know that sometimes some of us want to be like, tap out, can I take a break? That's totally fine, you can always do that. But then we come back and we re-encounter one another and the God who wrestles with us. In the earliest 20th century, 21st century actually, Reinhold Niebuhr, Christian ethicist and theologian of whom I have mentioned before. He was writing to a world that was divided in some similar ways to ours. There was a lot of tension inside of the church and inside of culture about who were we going to be? What did it mean to be a faithful people? There was a revolution happening in ways of understanding. Science and Darwinism had risen to the fore as a way of considering and understanding the ordering of the world and the universe. And there became a divide deep within the Christian church in the United States particularly. It was a controversy. And some went one direction and some went the other. And into this fray moved Reinhold Niebuhr, wanting to invite the church to not just split, to, but to re-remember it's calling to be a people who followed Yahweh God, who follow the perfectionist ethic, to quote him, not myself, of love, the perfectionist ethic of love of Jesus Christ. And so as we gather to look for and await that coming of Christ, we gather as a people seeking that. So no matter what you hear today, if you notice any uncomfortability, I would invite you to reconsider 
How has our formation as people who 98% of it happens outside of church, how is what we hear and how we hear each other shaped by the culture and time in which we live? Not to jettison it, but to be aware of it so we can revisit God's story and God's invitation again and challenge each other to wrestle so that we might more fully embrace and follow the call to be a people who follow Jesus. Reinhold Niebuhr's invitation was that in a world where, on one hand, some members of the church had chosen an ethic of love which became very personal, very privatized, and that salvation was only for me, and another portion of the church that said the only way to live the gospel is through justice, that he wanted to bring those things together, not just because, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr had a few thoughts, but because Reinhold Niebuhr believed that that was the call of the gospel, that the law of love to which the gospel spoke was something that held together love and justice. That it was always an inward transformation which invites us to live outwardly. And that the outward life shapes us inwardly. And that our faith is not just something that happens this direction, but happens this direction and inside of us as well. And so today, as we consider that the law is love, I want to invite us again to come to that candlelight and to seek out a love that invites all of us, the whole of us, and indeed is something that is good news for our whole world. In the passage that Bruce read for us this morning from Luke chapter 10, it's a teacher who comes to Jesus, a lawyer, trying to test Jesus, you know, trying to like paint him in a corner a little bit and be like, okay, you know, because if he gets this wrong, we all can be like, next, right off that guy, right? He's a heretic. What if he says the wrong thing? And when tested to say, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, of course, puts the question back to him, which is such a great tactic that I wish I employed more. Jesus says back to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer answered and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replies to him, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Some of you have heard how my spouse who uh, went to seminary, when he turned in his final paper, he put a post-it note on the very front of his final paper in which he had to defend his statement of faith. And he said, listen, it all can be summarized in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, in so many ways, he was right. That most fundamentally, the call that we have as a Christian people is to be a people of love. That's it. I mean, God is love. They will know we're Christians by we're love. Jesus says here, and it's repeated again in two other Gospels, that all of the law and the prophets is summarized and summed up in this love the Lord your God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, other things are important. But that's the thing. That's it, actually. The call of Christian love and the embodiment of Emmanuel God with us is the reminder that the only law and the beginning and end of all things is love. Of course, living this out, figuring out what it means, and actually doing the work of love is a lifetime of learning and unlearning, of trial and error, of mistakes and possibilities. But this is where today I want to bring us is deeper into this invitation and the way that the law of love has always been multi-directional. It's a call that invites us to live out a way of being in communion with the God of the universe that then changes and transforms us from the inside out that we live in that love and from that overflow we live love with one another. Love, of course, is both a profound moving space for us in our personal relationships. To live love can be a beautiful thing. It's also one of the most vulnerable things that we can ever do. It asks us to risk, to show up, to admit when we're wrong, 
and to be open to the possibility of it. But in this call to love our neighbors and in the biblical witness that we read throughout scripture, the call of love is not a call of sentimentality. The call here in the New Testament to agape love isn't one that's a theory. It's, it's love with skin on. This is part of the profound message of the Christian narrative of good news is that God is not far off or removed, but God likewise is taken on human skin and knows what it is to be amongst us. No suffering and pain and longing. Knows risk and vulnerability. Knows what it is to not be loved. To love is something that asks us likewise to put skin on and to live. To live love. And to live love for our neighbors isn't something, again, that's sentimental or abstract. It's something that takes into account the particularity of their circumstance and the moment in which we live. This is where we see the connection between agape, love, and what he, Jesus is referencing here in the Gospel writers in talking about these texts that would have been central and important for the Hebrew people. Here in the greatest commandment, two different texts are referenced, one being from Leviticus, from Leviticus 19, the call to love your neighbor as yourself. This appears in Leviticus in a section related to the way that justice and the ordering of communal life happened and transpired. And the second is the Shema, referenced first in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the call to love your God who is one. This call of a love that goes this direction and this direction and within us is one then that I would argue the opposite side of that coin, another biblical way for understanding love, is the call of justice. To quote Brother Cornell West, he says, justice is what love looks like in public. Each year at Christmas, we proclaim through the Christmas carols we sing that the invitation is the invitation to peace. That on these silent nights and holy nights, we look for peace. And peace in the biblical conception, going way back to the earliest texts, is that of shalom. A vision of rightness both within us, but the right ordering of community. The way that we order our lives together. And we see that this persists throughout the Hebrew Bible. One of my favorite passages and sections is from Isaiah, which during the Christmas story, we return to those texts and Jesus himself identifies himself as the suffering servant in Isaiah. But the book of Isaiah itself opens with a challenge and an invitation to God's people that they have forgotten the ways of God and that to walk in the ways of God invites them to learn anew to cleanse themselves, to get injustice out of God's sight, to cease to do evil and learn to do good, to search for justice and help the oppressed, protect the orphan and plead the case of those who are widowed. Yahweh says of this, that should you choose this pathway, that though your sins are like scarlet, they can be as white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they can be like white like fleece. The Hebrew word here is mishpat. It's this way of understanding justice as the doing of it, as the according to people the rights and the things which they are due as God's people, as God's children made in God's image. Throughout the book of Isaiah, there is a wedding of two conceptions then of justice. Mishpat, this sense of a justice that is the rightness of life together, and then also this sense that each is due certain rights or obligations as part of the community. This is then put together with Zedek. Conception of justice, which is sometimes thought of as the plumb line. It's the through line. The way that we are both, sometimes in English we say righteous, we're made rendered righteous. It's another way of understanding this dual conception that if love looks like both the relationship between us, within ourselves, and a relationship to God, that love and justice are also opposite sides of the same coin, the ways that we who know what love looks like, we work for that with our neighbors. 
This is then a justice that is both us justified in our relationship to God, but that calls us to live a justice mishpat in the way that we live and order our lives one with another. Christian ethicist Nicholas Walterstoff had a talk that he gave at Biola. He talks about this in multiple places, but this is one of the spaces where he talks about that sometimes what's happened is that in the Christian tradition, we've thought that wrath and justice is the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew God who's angry and wrathful. And so we think of love in the New Testament as more divorced from that. And yet, if we look at the witness of Jesus, the way he inaugurates his mission here on earth, and what is said of him and what he is referencing, he's talking about this God who is the same throughout all of the witness of God, journeying with God's people, in the sense that love is something that is both personal, but it's also that invitation to how we live and how we show up. And that's what we want to do. As we are God's people looking for the light that still comes, the Savior God, Emmanuel, God with us, we want to be a people who hold together these tensions. Where we think of love as the profound encounter and experience of knowing ourselves beheld in the gaze of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And that that love changes and transforms us for as we are seen, we then extend that sight and recognition so that we work to ensure that for all of our neighbors, that that same experience of a love that honors them is possible. Now, many of you know that I'm a little obsessed with my spouse, <laughs> Andy Garbers. One of the reasons I say that I married him is because he always saw me. He always heard me. And in a world and in a community where I grew up that women didn't matter as much as men, to have a man see me meant so much. And I knew it was love. He's always seen me and not been threatened. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about this candle of love. It's the light of love that warms our hearts so that we remember that we don't have to live according to the laws of this world. We live according to the law of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that love is one thing. The law is love. That is why, as I shared in the children's sermon, my favorite Christmas carol is O Holy Night. I remember the experience in high school where every year Chad Junker, who some of you know, who was my choral teacher, he had us do that song. And together, all of the students in all of our choirs would perform in sign language the lyrics and we would sing and sign together that God's law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall God break for the slave is our brother, is one of us. And in God's name, all oppression shall cease. Therefore, sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise God's holy name. For Christ is our Lord. May we all worship and adore. And may we live and share a light with one another in this whole world. That is the light of love. May the love of Christ be yours and may it transform us that we might be God's church now and evermore. Amen. And I came to walking on the train tracks. How do I get here? How do I get back? I've been up all night, let's stay awake Push it further, you know I'll never break 
At some point in the party I thought my heart was failing You said that you're okay, you seem to still be standing Flashes appeared in the corner of my eyes I saw the stars and I didn't ask why Heard the voices and caught my breath So close and yet so far from death Close and yet so far from death So close and yet so far from death well, the feeling was always too much for me It always came too strong I wanted to get it right so bad That I always got it wrong So you keep pushing on You hope it won't be long You could find the child that you were And find a way to get along so don't go blindly into the dark And every one of us shines a light of love Don't go blindly into the dark And every one of us shines a light of love Don't go blindly into the dark And every one of us shines a light of love Don't go blindly into the dark And every one of us shines a light of love Some of you who have been around this church for a long time remember when we used to organize groups who would ring the bell at Christmas time for the Salvation Army. I'm a big fan of the Salvation Army for the way that they selflessly reach out and care for some of the most needy around the Twin Cities, around the world. I saw this, uh, this mother and daughter ringing a bell at the grocery store the other day and there they were. It was a little bit cold out, not as cold as I remember sometimes. But they were there ringing the bell, ringing the bell, ringing the bell. And every time somebody would stop and drop some money in there, they said, that's going to make a difference in someone's life. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Coming back out, ringing the bell, ringing the bell. People dropped it. Thank you for putting money in our bucket. That's going to make a difference in someone's life. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I loved it. I, I couldn't stop thinking about it throughout the rest of the day. You know, when we stop in the service and we think about generosity and we think about offering our gifts, abilities, and talents to the mission of this church. It, it's like you dropping money in that, that kettle because it's going to make a difference in people's lives. It's going to make a difference in our children and youth. It's going to make a difference as God forms your soul through the programs and activities that are happening in the life of this church. It's going to change people's lives, make a difference in people's lives as we 
support our missionaries here and around the world. Your generosity is making a difference. So thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your giving. And of course, you can see on the screen, there's lots of ways that you can give. Lots of ways that are convenient for you when we're not together. Thank you for the way you keep supporting this church and support the mission of this church. May God bless you. Let us pray. God, thank you for this amazing congregation, this, this pool of gifts and abilities and talents gathered together in your name to do good. And thank you for the resources that you have given each of us that as we give them back to this mission, you bless them and you use them and you direct us and you lead us for your glory. For that's what we want to do is to give you glory in all that we do. So bless these offerings as you've already blessed those who have given. For we pray this in your name. Amen. It's good to be together and to worship together. One of the things I wanted to invite you to do this week is a practice that Jeff Lindsay actually does in his office. 
is he lights a candle every day to remind him and us that God's spirit is present. So I'd invite you this week as you light your candle to light the candle of love. And might it serve as a remembrance that the law is love. And might we then live that love, a love for God, a love that we know in ourselves, a love for one another. And may we embody it as the justice of God, the mishpat, bringing forth the light of love and the good news for all of the earth. Go with the light of love and in the spirit that we might be the church. Amen.